Hey, good evening. Sam here. Welcome to Relove Guitars. Um, we're towards the tail end of January. Uh, hmm, hang on, we've got a great big thing sticking in the way here. I don't know why that's the way it is. Just one second, please. Mm -hmm. Tweak that. Tweak that. Mm -hmm. Tweak this. Tweak that. And that's probably a bit less interesting. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, towards the end of January. And... Um, Had a, had a few interesting things um, that I've been doing over the, the last little while. Um, mostly catching up on builds and things like that, so <clears throat> it's quite nice when you're in that post-Christmas slight slowdown. Um, but anyway, so I've been doing making things, um, things, things that are ready to be put together and go, like strats and things like that. Anyhow, um, I'm just going to hang this up. So what we've got here on this Sunday, yes, yeah, it's a Sunday. We've got David's RG um, series, and I can't remember what the model is. It should tell me on the back. It's the RG370 AHMZ. So mm -hmm, Ash Heavy Metal Z. Um, Z maybe Z refers to the channel though. but it's a lovely stable tremolo and you can see this thing it's got a lovely black um, painted ash with the sort of the grain picked out in a lighter um, thing I don't quite know how you achieve that effect but it's very nice and then you've got the natural ash on the back there and a pretty much unfinished looking feeling um, neck here as well which is gorgeous locking tuners um, and kind of the usual Ibanez stuff um, with the uh, tremolo adjuster unit here all set up for the nine gauge that um, David uses. So um, what we're going to do with this one is, should be fairly straightforward. Um, this is going to be uh, a lowering of the action and what David had found that he was getting some some buzzing down here and that's because the um, relief on this neck is practically non-existent so we do need to make an adjustment um, on that um, so we'll put a tiny bit of relief into it we'll also lower the action here um, which I'll measure it first and get a couple of readings because um, this one we're going to do by uh, lowering the bridge and the way we do that is by lowering down the posts so that we can get a better action. Um, that's the only point at which you can adjust the action on this type of guitar. Um, I just need to clean this, clean this thing so I can draw on it. Uh, done, done, done. Everything done. Everything done. Everything done. So we can take our readings in here. I'll put my close-up specs on. Ha -ha. So I mean at this end we've got still got a fairly high um, first for action. I don't think there's any shims under there. But let's take a reading on it just to be on the precise side. Stay up there, thank you. Um, because it, ideally I would prefer that a little lower on a guitar like this. But I don't think um, David's had any problems with it. I don't think he's unhappy with it the way it is. Um, yeah, it's quite... It's a, a bit of a gradient. They've done... I mean, it's quite... A, it's their way of doing it. I think what we find is that the... I think we're, we're about 2.5 on the... Let's write it down. I think we're about 2.5 on the low E. Uh, 0.25 B G T A E. So 0.25. We've got say 0.35 uh, on the B. I think we've, I'm guessing these because 0.35. About 0.4. 0.5. 
four on the G, and I think what they're what we're seeing is that they're going up all the way across. Uh, yeah, point twenty-five, point three five, point four, point five. I would say that one is. So point point three five, not point four, not point five. I'll just check that last one there. With the, this stuff comes off very quickly. Point three, point two five. That's fifty-five. Now it's a little bit high. That's just about, that's 55, so I was correct, that's 0.5. That's a fraction too high, so it would be interesting to see if there are some uh, shims under here, um, which that's the way you would set the first fret action on one of these RGs. Uh, I had a 370 years ago, and it wasn't as flash as this baby. This is beautiful. Okay, so that's just, I mean, it's not bad, and I know that David's kind of obviously been used to playing at this action. And you know some people like that sort of high to low from the low E down to the high E prefer that that way, um, which is fine. Uh, let me just have a look at the actions across here. So I said it was about three. Um, well, I was I was lying really. It's it's not quite that high. It's it's two. 2 and 1.7, 2 and 1.7, um, 2 mils, oh, excuse me, I've got something in my eye now, okay, and a spectrum in between, or a, sp a gradient in between, um, but again, that's higher than it needs to be, and I know that David wants it a little bit lower than that, so we'll aim to lower that, but that means if I'm going to take it down um, we should be able to get down to um, 1.2 on the high E, and I think 1.5 oh, is a standard target action for me on the uh, low E. And so that's a that's a one mil there. That's a, a 0.5 there. What am I talking about? If we want to tick, we want a 0.5 there, which is translates to. Uh, that's 0.75 over two thirds of the three quarters of the way across got to be a little bit higher so we're going to go um, minus 0 0.7 there and we're going to go uh, minus 5. Are we 5 off both? Yes we are. So it's minus 0 0.7 off each end really. Um, and so that's a, that's a, a, whatever we do it's the same number of turns on the posts. Um, now the difficulty is measuring exactly. Uh, normally um, I annoy people, upset people very much by making adjustments with this um, thing. Under load, is that the right word? Yes, under load. And people can get very upset because they, they, there's a school of thought that says it damages the, um, the races, the faces of the pivot point. Um, personally, I've, I'm still waiting to hear a good argument for why, why or how that is. Um, however, you know, when it comes to expensive piece of kit like this I don't want to uh, challenge the preconceptions or you know conventional wisdom I should say just for the sake of it um, okay um, so we're going to basically take this action down with this propped up um, supported um, but not under pressure now the, the funny part about this is when 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 people say um, they, they want to they, they would like to adjust the action of this um, not under pressure. The only way you're ever going to take this, take the pressure off this, is to remove both the springs in the back and the strings on the front. All right, because at the moment there's an equal amount of pressure uh, tension above and below, both pulling in that direction. Right, one pulling from the top, one pulling from the bottom, which keeps the middle piece, the piece in the middle, in equilibrium. Um, if we if we take the strings off, it's going to go it's going to um, go down where the springs want to pull it, but it'll still be under tension from the springs. So technically, there's no um, short of taking the springs as well as the um, strings off. There's no technical way of, of adjusting this with no tension on it. So we'd have to we'll go to that length to prove the point or to, to be correct. 
Um, so we know what we've got in terms of the overall action height that we want to come down. Um, we know what we want to do with the tension on the neck. So the, I suppose the first thing is the relief we can make an adjustment to. Let's get our open our little truss rod access cover, which is there. -da. So we want to uh, slack this off a little bit. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. Um, but we can either use a very nice, conveniently long. It's a four millimeter. Should be a four millimeter doofer. Um, make it sure it's nice and snug and then we'll slack it off a little bit. This is always the same because it's slightly under pressure so it's hard to get it back out again. So what we're looking for is a bit more a bit more relief. Remember these are nines so they're not putting a massive load on. Um, this is a bit iffy to use. I'll go and use my spanner, ball ended spanner thing which gives me uh, Probably a good enough. Mm, no, actually, doesn't give me a good enough run on it. Let's try the longer bit. Mm. Now this is now gone slackish, and I'm going to assume. Don't know with these, but uh, well, I could be wrong actually. I sort of had an assumption this was a, a two-directional. Oh yeah, that's actually quite good. A two-directional truss rod so that positively turning it in the counterclockwise would actually physically push some bow and um, some relief into it. it. Doesn't feel like that, it feels like it's just um, going to slack and that's your lot. So anyway, the first thing is we freed up those notes. Now these also feel a little bit sharp on the edges, so I'm gonna when the strings are off, I'm gonna go over all these little corners with um, a little fret file, um, so that's okay. We'll we'll leave that as is for a minute. That's that adjusted. Um, now, like I said, the thing we're going to have to do is to support this here. Um, we can use a number of one of any number of things. We we'll need this, um, but we'll support it so we can put these. Uh, we don't need all of that. Right, I've got some. I've got a, a wooden wedge, but I think wooden's not good enough. And I've got some foam, but I'm not sure foam is quite the right strength for this. Let's have a look. No, that will sit, sit down. Where's that sit on the little edge there? Could possibly sit that on top of that. Um, I know, we'll get, we'll get the little wedge with a plastic, it's got a bit of plastic on it, especially for this, but I still think plastic's a little bit too hard, so we'll go wood against, soft wood against metal, against the plastic. There we go. So that's put that in a sort of held position, which means we can take the strings off and um, and then also, we can, when it comes to it, we can take off the uh, springs as well to make the adjustment with absolutely zero tension on it. So I'll just hold those two off for a second because we've still got to get the back off here. So this is a nice little unit. It's designed so that you can make adjustments without having to take the back off if you don't want to. But some people say or the word is if you're you can either um if you're going to just change the strings you could prop it up like i just did and then um, change the strings and it should be pretty much in the same place afterwards because the tension of the same gauge will be the same but uh, other people say you could um, change the strings one at a time but that, that sort of works but there is a bit of give in between because um, you're taking you know one sixth of the loading off it so it will change the position but it's it's probably still effective rather than taking the whole thing off there's a what's this here that's just some polish um, 
It's lovely looking ash. Beautifully machined, I mean, you know, gorgeous CNC, very smooth lines. Um, is that one caught under there? Shouldn't be. Blimey, that's quite tight fitting. Okay, so um, um, uh, that's our primary screws, um, which we're going to have to unhook here to take off. But let's take the string loading off first. Um, so that we need to, for that purpose, we'll need to undo the locking nut. Um, I've seen uh, lots of, as you probably have, seen lots of videos on um, fitting, uh, doing re um, restrings using, or restrings for such tremolo systems. And one of the things that um, struck me in the, in the few that I watched is that almost nobody uh, concentrated or I didn't see anybody mention um, stretching the strings out before or prepping the fine tuners. It's really important that there's a sort of little dance you have to do. Um, otherwise you find yourself tightening it up, going out tune, running out of adjustment and then starting all over again. So one of the critical things for getting it right is to get the new strings um, stretched out fully. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about um, stretching where the slack comes from. It just means stretching the slack in the, the string train, you could call it, you know. Um, whether it's the string stuff wound around the post or whether it's wound, you know, caught up in the bottom section there. You want to get all of that slack out of it before um, you lock down these. And you want the slack, slack all taken out of it. Um, oh, look at me, I went and forgot to prop up this before. You want all the slack taken out of it before you um, do anything um, with locking it down. It's really important. Okay, so you sit there my friend. Okay, so this is a set of nines that are in fairly good condition, but um, David's supplied new only ball nines for a refit or the setup. So hopefully I'm hoping that when we take down the action slightly at the um, bridge post, I'm hoping that we get down to that nice low action without the need for any fret leveling. I kind of would hope so with a guitar like this and, and usually um, Ibanez's are pretty good. Okay, so um, there we are. What I'm going to do is, before I take these off, I'm just going to have a look under here because I want to see if there's any, um, uh, if there is any, sh uh, if there are any shims under there that are obviously easy to remove or adjust because sometimes they, they have one half on one side, half on the other side. So I'll just have a quick, quick look. Um, just get a slightly larger. I always like this uh, setup. Um, obviously, I would like to use a, not necessarily the locking part, but it would be great to use this metal nut on every um, on every guitar um, because it's so accurate. This is this is you know these are made so well, and this is so accurate that you can raise it and lower it in tiny increments. Well, I say you can raise it and lower it. Actually, what you do here is raise it because you'll see that there's no, there are no shims under here. Um, there's just plain wood. Now, that means this thing is already been machined and fitted to its absolute lowest level. Um, so I'm going. I'm not going to mess with it since um, David hasn't complained of it personally. If this was my own guitar, I would probably um, take that down. Or, to be more precise since these these are easier to work if you like this this is harder to work flat this is machined flat in the factory I would
probably work this down a little bit at the base to take half a mil off there and that would give us um, the kind of action or oh, what did I say at the uh, at the first fret well you know it would it would give us um, you know give us a, well, I wouldn't take that much off actually I'd, I'd probably take 0.2 off um, this end and nothing by the time we go across uh, but it's pretty close so that was just out of interest that I was looking at that I've also scraped it back just to get rid of any burrs from the, the screw holes in case that was keeping it a little bit proud of the mark but I mean and you, if you were if it was your guitar and you want to do you could do a little bit of careful sanding there and take it down a little bit and it would work um, but it's not far off just make this as nice and firm there we go okay um while these are off i want to do the a little bit of fret work on the edges just a tiny bit try and, try and take the little sharpness off um but what we also now need to do is we need to take off the springs um well, actually we need to take the strings out and keep these for reuse as sacrificial strings um now this is a another hex key arrangement and that's not the right one again uh, this is four this is not four it's going to be something like a three is it three or two of course in the old days we have had them pinned to the back of the headstock there we go See, this is the oldie worldy style where you put the string in and clamp it down. Not my favourite arrangement. I much prefer a catch in the bridge unit itself where you can actually put uh, uh, the ball end in. I find that's a, it's kind of designed to hold the weight or the tension of the string. And instead of that, what we're using here is a brute force against. Um, the material of the string, which I always find a not very sophisticated way of doing things. I mean, you can see it works, obviously, but um, unsophisticated. Well, these are quite good. Um, are they any good for anything? Think about it. No, only for Floyd Rose, so I might as well bin those. Okay, so now we have the thing unstrung, and where we to where we to just put some strings on there now. This this would obviously just go back to where it was but what we've got is we've got the tremolo um, pulling in this direction as well um, now we can we can I don't want to change any of these settings really um, although it's you know it's it's doable but what I'll do is I'll take off these screws first um, if I'm not mistaken these don't come flying out they're uh, hooked in but that's just a retainer screw and then you can pull them out as if you were removing a standard spring from a, a strap style tremolo with something like this anyway. and that there's one and there's the tether Lovely, lovely, lovely. Take this over here. We've got a little bit of um, tension still on it from the back springs. Um, uh, yes, of course, I forgot all these lovely little pieces fell out. Just my luck. <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'll, just, I'll double check, but I'm pretty certain they're all exactly the same. Uh, it looks like it wants to come out. Come on. Um, magnetic, possibly. Well, that doesn't want to come out, but that's all right. Okay, so we could um, we could take the other ones off, uh, which come off here. I don't, like I say, without this is without taking any of the um, uh, taking any of the adjusters, changing any of the adjusters. So we've got 
we got spring comes off here. It's actually quite relatively easy to remove like that. This one off there. So that's taken all the loading off and the whole thing comes out like that. So we just we know where we've got to put them back together again. So the, the key thing is there's no loading on these posts now and now we've got to reduce them by 0.7 of a millimeter. Um, there's, there's the internal workings. It's a nice unit. I do like it. Um, so the first question is, do we have downward room? Now that's going to be an interesting one. And I do not make any assumptions that's the case. So what I'm going to do, just for the sake of sanity, I'm going to find me, find me the right thing. And I'm going to put me a marker on here. close. Now look, some naughty people are going to say what it looks like. Now I have to get down by the sum total of seven of a mil. So I'm going to try and do it by measuring to the surface of the, of the guitar, which is actually a little bit imprecise. We call it 595 okay, at the moment and we want to take it down to, uh, well, it will be 3.7525 via adjusting this down. So I'm going to do half a turn first clockwise to take it down. Half a turn clockwise. So I'm going to write it down. Um, so we'll write the column half turns one, five, nine, five. Again, this is very trying to be very careful. Five, three, six. All right, let's do a quarter turn now. Still doing it. Thankfully, that means we've got room for the adjustment. Um, so half plus a quarter, that's what we've done. Brings us to five, twelve. Okay, that's close enough. It's a tiny bit under. Um, so we know now on this side we want to do a half and a quarter turn. One half, one quarter. -da. It's all like that. Now we're ready to reassemble. But while the bits are off, all oh, the nice little metal, that's just so fiddly to hold a string in place. Ow. Um, we'll just move all this out of the way for a second. And now I'm going to get me the, what do you call it, this thing. It's got a safe edge on it, the back edge, so I'm going to do a very careful little, little corner edging. Right? And that's just to take off the little burrs that I can feel. So I'm just coming around and in front. They've been actually um, lacquered over, polyed over, um, but there's still that little bit sticking out. So it's just a very a very delicate, a very gentle adjustment. And I'm going to feel this edge here. If there's any sticking out, we'll just manually go over them. A tiny, sharp edge. So even though this is not massively, um, it's not sanding them smooth if you like it, it, it is it does help just to take any burrs away and, and it's no harm to the fret you don't need to tidy up or soften out this file mark because it's right on the end in this place where it doesn't get in the way of playing often it's the lower edge where your fingers get the most contact that kind of stands out. So tomorrow I've got lots of good things to do. I've nearly finished poly and um, polying true oiling my next strap custom strap that's coming through the body and that's ready to attach to that neck we saw a little bit earlier. Um, 
and then that's ready, pretty much ready to put together and fit the hardware. If you find one, if you feel there is one causing a burr, you can just take a little file and just check it with the edge of the file across the uh, edge of the fret. And that should just arrest. They've put a little blob of finish on here to kind of soften it off anyway, but that really won't stop it if the um, if the frets kind of starting to extend past the end you see like I can hear that one already so it's just a little bit of extra clean up really I suppose you could call it and it's as long as you do it on the mark you know on the in the same position as the fret it's uh, doesn't cause any marks to the fingerboard you can see you can see where it's uh, sticking out quite a bit can hear that one biting nicely. So might just kind of run them all over. And then we've got to do the uh, corners and the edges of the other side as well, just to be on the safe side. <laughs> safe side. So, so 2020, apart from being the year of scary things like cor coronavirus. Um, it's not only coronavirus, but it might as well be the year that I strike out to get a bit more space and a bit more equipment for the really loved guitars undertaking. Now, when you get to here, you've got a slight limitation by the way, you can't, without taking the neck off, you can't really get into there very well, but you can, you can get in and just pull back a little bit, but support the uh, file so it doesn't go down and touch the finish. And then we'll go this way. Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a kind of, my plan for the year is to get some, more space and a scabby, scabby finish on there. I don't like, I don't like. I'm going to see if we can, let's get a bit of protective blade and see if we can just lift this off using the, the <laughs> probably better off using the green stuff, eh? But this is not very good. Let's use green. Good technique for just giving you a slightly raised blade um, so you can expose a small area for scraping um, but avoid scraping anything else you don't want to get other than that small area. So what you tend to do is choose your area for the scraping. That's all that don't do. So put this down halfway along like that. Then we get another bit. So we put that down there too. And we just keep a little window of blade exposed. And we can tear that there. Oops, damn it. It's not what we wanted to do. Hold on. Let's just, let's just chop my own fingers off, shall we? Fold that, fold that. Okay, that gives us a little working area. I can see, yeah, I can see the, the finishes come up and over. Very gently take this away so it's not scratching anymore. Okay, whatever that was. 
still got to do the thing with the file, but okay, it's just taken that a bit of gunk that it got built up there in the factory. It's not perfect, um, but it's better than it was. Okay, so now we come down here with this. Oh, you can't see very well and then just run down yeah they, they put glue or probably glue actually on here just to try and soften off the ends um, and that's okay but it's not worked completely it may be to do with small tiny microscopic changes in the wood moisture levels um, which is how you get your fret sprout and it's inevitable because at the point of beveling these frets, they are microscopically flat, flush to the wood. And then of course, if the wood moves so much as a hundredth of a millimeter back, you get like a, like a chisel blade exposed, uh, which your fingers will feel straight away, because of course they're very, very, very sensitive to tiny, imperfections, particularly if they're razor sharp. So I'm just going to do this run down and then just um, gently. Now this way we've got the same challenge with this one. And we can only go so far, so I'll come back. So right now, I'm just holding it in place and just starting with the ones I can reach. I'm just taking the, this glue, slightly taking this glue stuff off in just filing away from the edge so it's not biting anymore. Yeah, so 2020, if we make it through and we don't get Coronad, amongst other things. Um, I want to expand Real Love Guitars and get a situation where I've got uh, space to uh, use some good tools to make what I'm doing more efficient and better quality. Um, I'm proud of what I've done so far. Sorry. Um, but I need to go up to the next level, as they say, in The Apprentice. Take the business to the next level. Okay, now we've got a similar thing with a couple of um, frets needing pulling up or needing just a little bit of a backward rub here. Now what I would typically normally do is uh, I would, in the fret polishing process, I would then soften all of these out um, with sandpaper, but it's in good good condition, and I don't think we'll need touch wood, I don't think we'll need to level the frets. Okay, so we've got the action lowered. Um, I've got to figure out the... Uh, figure out the reinstallment of this business here into the little what's it over the what's it into the little what's it over the what's it that's that bit everything looking good looking at the edge of these um, the edge of these blades looks pretty good So we've now lowered it, our new 
no one wants it. Um, oh yeah, this has to go that side of that, doesn't it? Uh. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how this goes because I haven't done one of these before. Uh, it has to go in there. And this has to go behind there, I believe. Like that. Okay, that's its stop point. And then I'm holding this now because it seems to me to make the most sense. Because I don't want this flapping about. So we're going to end up putting it back under sprung pressure to begin with. kind of pliers let me think the problem is I can get to the hole but the hole doesn't want to go through there and maybe I'll try it in this at this angle First, I don't know. It's probably the easiest bit to do. Stay put. <laughs> no, I can't really get much less movement out of it. If I wound it out, it would still be quite a long way out. The funny pliers that don't turn it in the right direction there. Making it hard for me. Now that's in, but it doesn't want to stay in there because it wants to flop down. So let's put a small screw in there first to keep it in place. Mm -hmm. Let's find a screwdriver. Okay, so this is getting it in place. What I could probably do to make my life a little easier would be to pop that under there. I'll actually leave that there for a minute. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Tell I'm not used to these little babies. Okay, let's put that. And there like that. Wood, 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 wood up, wood. Wood up, wood. Like that. Thank you. Take that off. Go over that side again. Now, this is an even bigger stretch if we do that. Um, now, we don't need to do that, do we? Because that's, we put that one on, that's holding that in place. Come back again, sorry. Hold on. Let's put the second one on. Probably some special tool for holding these things better than I'm doing. But that one seems simpler. But it's the angle of the the claw, the little hooky bit that wants to come back out when the tremolo is at this angle. So we just persuade it to stay where we want it. Thusly. And we can tighten it up afterwards if we need to. 
Then we come over to hill. Then we come to here. Check that uh, everything's in the right place. Faces are on the, what do you call them? Blades correctly. And then we can prop it up. Okay. Um, we've got all the little saddle bits here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do up these two retainers with a little bit of extra push. Not much. Okay, in you go. In you go. You can feel when they stop. It's not that complicated. Okay, so we've dropped the action there. We've um, done the truss rod adjustment there. That's good. The next stop is we hope that these frets all play at this new chosen action. Now I don't have any guarantee that that's the case. So we could possibly may have made sense to get the old strings and use those first try. I think I can find where they went. Was that them? Yeah, that was them. Um, I'm just checking these to try and see if there's any difference. They're all the same. They're all the same. And that goes in like... I actually can't see how that goes in, but they must be. Must be. Must be. in there underneath the pushy bit and that goes there like that bit yeah so I think a good idea would be to put these if we can reuse these just long enough to check that the action is is right and if it isn't we have, we need to do any fret leveling then we've got these old strings on ready um, which saves wasting any new ones now these are a bit already a bit tangled up so that's a bit a bit of careful untangle of eating to do coiled up strings are just trouble waiting to happen they catch and snag absolutely everything right let's see if we can Extricate them one by one. Low E, come to Papa. If we can't get it out that way, we'll unhook it at this end. We could straighten it, that would be one sensible way, but we've got it this way. Right, so we're going to put this back in and to its little restrain a bit. like that and then we're going to tighten it back up sorry it's so slow and fiddly but that's how it is yes so this year that's what I want I'm going to investigate the possibilities of what it would take to get a premises and do this properly because I enjoy it and I could be a lot more effective and higher quality I think would be the, the other thing if I had the uh, space really and, and actually as important would be some key pieces of woodworking equipment that I don't currently have any access to. One of which is a planer thicknesser, because it's a critical piece of stuff, instead of trying to do it by um, router, which I now have to kind of store up and go off and do it somewhere else, for the sake of the neighbours, it's not their fault. Um, but yeah, 
planar thicknesser followed by uh, perhaps a, a better quality band saw and belt sander and possibly even a, in a table saw, circular saw, table saw, circular saw, I suppose that's what it is. Um, yeah, those kinds of things that would, would um, make, hopefully, make woodworking a lot easier and also a lot more professional in terms of jointing and things like that, because right at the moment my jointing is pretty poor. Um, I'm not happy with it, put it that way. So, as much as, as much as possible, I end up trying to use one-piece bodies, um, but shouldn't have to be constrained to that. You know, it's both expensive and, and sometimes just not appropriate. Um, so, a good jointer will change that altogether. All right, so you see we're, we're getting there slowly, back to um, a set of probably doable upable strings and the main thing really in this is just to be able to do them up and check the playing action and I think we should be quite nice and low got to get these in the right place there is not a lot of room for gripping these strings I have to say it's very fine and finally the high E Take the strings off next time one of the things I just want to check on is make sure these um, what do they call them you know those things hey the nuts on the tuners are done up properly that's what I need to check but not yet need to do the locking nuts up on this right now. Because we just need to check out the, the height. I don't need to be too much worried about the tuning, just the height and the playability vis-a-vis -vis the frets. And that's the main concern at the moment. Stands. I don't really know what the best option is for getting set up with some premises, um, apart from you know maybe this sort of business plan and borrowing route, which I haven't done with three really, lots, so you never know. Might be a, a worthwhile thing to have a talk through. Either that, um, or maybe find somebody doing similar woodwork. Um, who might have sharing options in their workshop tends to be less likely. I haven't found anybody in that position yet. Um, not to say it doesn't happen, but Blimey. plenty of winding on. more than you actually need. Okay, so that was my scientific method for taking down the uh, 
playing action at the last fret. Um, again, it's not scientific. Um, it's much easier if you are able to do that with the strings on, but I'm aware that you know people aren't happy with that and worried about damage to the faces, hence doing it slightly more fiddly way of taking the loading off the tremolo, which means taking it apart and getting the unit out of the way. little thingies and let the thing seat where it wants to seat which is now too high um, let's take a start with a note from the machine okay so being a floating trim it's not really that much help so what we'll do is we'll do uh, the tuner, which is your best bet, um, to make sure that you're getting it up to I don't know, equilibrium, should we call it. Okay, let's go with the E first. E flat. everything will be out of tune again so we'll just give it a little bit of a pull to seat it and then we'll go again with the tuner and we do this until we get equilibrium fine tuners. So let's just look at where we've got to in terms of action. Um, that should have taken us down uh, somewhat. We're now down to yeah, just a fraction over. Could have done a tiny bit more on that um, edge. We're down to 1.2 on this edge so we technically could have done a bit more down here. Which is a shame. <laughs> well, we can do another half turn, um, but it'll we'll do it when we take the strings off. But the main concern for me now is, particularly at this edge, do these things play and do they choke out? tuner for this bit we just need to Thank you. 
bit of a little bit of clustering around there. Well, okay, so that's changed the game. There is some uneven frets. There are some uneven frets. So, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to level these frets, and I'm going to do it slightly differently in that I'm I'm not going to lower the action again because that takes requires taking all strings off, taking the bridge apart again, and I'm going to level the frets as it stands, concentrating on this area here. Um, which I know is you know, going to pro provide us with a slight problem. Um, um, and then once I've done that, I will take the strings off, we'll polish out, we'll, we'll sand out the frets. It's good in a way because we get to then <coughs> and sand out the fret edges as well. Um, and then we'll just make a, another half turn down on the on this side as we go. Um, the main other thing about this is you have got a little bit of high frets going along in that area so that's going to be a good solution. I'd hoped to get away without doing that but it's just the way it is I'm afraid. Um, I, I should point out that <coughs> Ibanez doesn't guarantee you freedom from uh, um, freedom from what's the word don't guarantee you freedom from needing fret leveling but often they've been good having said that um, I've had recently some Epiphones that have been fantastic as well uh, you know, so it's, it's not really brand specific. I'm just going to put a couple of bits of tape over these here. These are it. Um, yeah, so we do need to do the fret leveling and we'll it'll be able to um, We'll be able to free up this little patch here, which will make that fret there. So it's, it's in this area here. Um, we'll, be able to, we'll be able to make it play better. I, like I say, I had, I had hoped to um, find that it was good enough not to do it, but that's the way it goes. So here we go. Um, let's get our equal spacing. Mm -mm, mm -mm, right. So what's going to happen is we're going to make a load of um, dust on these in a minute. I've got to mark them up first. Um, we, we'll end up chucking a load of fret dust down on the fingerboard, but that's fine. We'll blow it away. Um, rumble tummy. Um, what I'll do is I will mark up the frets before we start, that always helps. Slow process, but... Um, as to whether these have been levelled before or not, I don't really know the answer to that. But, um, they don't look too stomped on, so um, maybe we've come out of the factory relying on the sort of overall pretty good action, but you can hear them starting to choke a little bit or buzz a little bit. Um, and I expect to see them cutting quite a bit round just after the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th frets. So, like I said, sometimes you can get away without having to do it. Other times you've just got to. So 
So the marker pen really is just a uh, gives you a guide, visual guide of what you're doing with the fret leveling. I'm, I'm using 400 grit um, sandpaper, which is a pretty light grade and it's quite safe. You can you're not going to be taking off a ton of material. Um, but if you've if you if you watched my videos before, you'll you'll understand why I do it this way. It's um it's, it's a, a tiny fraction more accurate, um, but that's not the reason I prefer to do it this way. The reason I prefer to do it this way is for the preservation of fret metal sake, um, because fret metal represents or equals the life of the guitar. So, um, you know, it's the, it's the one thing we want to preserve at all costs. And this method allows me to do that. Um, by default, it removes the least fret metal for the best leveling job. Um, which, which is why I continue to do it, because there is no other way that does it as uh, gently, I should suppose, is the right way to put it. Okay. If you're in this stage and you're not confident with your marker pen, you want to probably mask off your frets first, but this would be quite a hassle to do because we'd have to un Tangle, untangle, undo all the strings again, um, which we've already kind of been back there. Okay, so I've got my, um, I've got my, what do you call it? My truss rod is set to the right curve, um, and now I'm going to just use my string, my trusty all-purpose string, to pull that, what do you call it? Guitar string out to the side and move the string out of the way, and that gives me. A, access with my fret leveling tool and I'm going to gently run it up and down on here and we'll see what is cutting and what isn't and the kind of gaps we've got. Now at the moment it's telling me it's cutting here, here, not there. We've got a low patch here, we're cutting here and none there. So we've got two areas where it's cutting a little tiny gap in the middle so it's, it has got the right um, curve on it it's just showing you what the underlying frets are like so I'm just going to kind of keep working these a little bit just to make sure we're as good as we can be and bearing in mind that I was happy with where we got on the action of the high E so we don't need to adjust that any further so that's the high E leveled We'll just make a check. Fine. Now we'll do the B and kind of expect to see the same thing happening. Um, it tends to track across from one fret to another, sorry, one string to another. Um, if these three here are low frets, we'll probably find them low all the way across, or most of the way across. Um, and equally, if the ones after it are cutting up pretty well, we'll find them cutting up most, if not all of the way across. Okay, so I'm just working away. Now, it's the the, um, when you have the, when you're getting slight chokes when you bend the strings, um, it's you find that if this top E string is is choking on bends, um, it's because it's going across to where the G string normally sits and the, and it's finding high frets there. So first thing I do is check the individual notes. Then I'm going to bend. So that one, okay, I'm not going 
then too much. So that one there is choking out when it gets across there. So this is going to be the sort of tell tail um, bit of fret leveling. It's usually is it's on the G string that you have to you have to really get it right. I mean, it's the same applies to the other strings, but you find the sort of the limiting ones tend to be uh, the G string because of the bend, just the nature of bends really, um, and also then a little patch down here for the low strings, which are not quite happy. The D in particular isn't quite happy. So, so this is a critical string then in the fret leveling process. So we'll just pull it out of the way again, push it out of the way at this end. It gives me clear access, and then we. Just gently move off and do it. I'm expecting to see, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I already know I'm going to see, and that is some high spots down here. Now I'm also bending, uh, bending, I'm brushing out, blowing out as much of the dust as I can. I don't want it to really stick on the um, neck. Um, so I can just, if I can, dust it away first. That's a big help. Now what I'm looking for now is first of all all the notes to play. Which they do. Now we want this one. Cleaner, much cleaner in the bend. That's good. Okay, now we're on to the next stage, which is the not so good uh, lower notes, which we know are kind of choking, not choking, buzzing out, even just playing the notes down here. So this is quite critical to get these freed up, especially as I'm going to drop the action a little bit more on here too. Um, and we don't want to put new strings on and find that we've got. Uh, you know, we're, we can't actually play at that height because it's not an unusual, 1.5 should be an easy for a uh, Ibanez like this. 1.5 on the low E last fret should be way easy. So I'm just doing minor, tiny little adjustments to the curve of the truss rod. Um, quite a few people who've bought my ebook and tried this method have asked me various questions about the different truss rods they've tried and had more or less success with. Um, the thing about the truss rod is you really have to keep experimenting until you find one that you're, you, you feel works. It's, it's, I know it's a bit unscientific, but the truss rod needs to bend uniformly across its length. Um, and you can only really know that by trial and error, by getting a few and, and comparing them and drawing them out against each other. Um, and that's just there's kind of no shortcut to that. Um, so this isn't always the case that the first one you buy from the kind of parts dealer is going to be the one that works for you. Um, unfortunately, it would be very nice if it were. Okay, now, if I recall a minute ago, the D at this action was sounding a little bit buzzy when we got up to there, 13, 14, 15. Not bad, I'm gonna do it a little bit extra, um, simply because, in fact, I'll recalibrate it first. I'm going to do it extra because I know I need this to be dead level because we're going to drop the action that little tiny bit more in a minute. Um, so there's no messing about. This has got to be good. The thing about this method is it, it makes no apologies that it doesn't level absolutely. It levels to the action you've chosen. And that's why I'm making a bit of a deal about this particular string because I know I know that um, we're going to lower it a little bit so I need it to be a bit leveler than the actual action I set it for currently. Uh, if that sort of makes sense. So I'm going to just overdo it for this particular action since I'm going to lower it in a minute. I 
can see that there's um, there's low spots here, which, which are the limiting factor. Actually, low spots are more of a problem than your high spots. It's good. So 13, 14, 15. Okay, 13, 14, 15 sound a bit crappy uh, at this action. And again, we know we're going to go lower, so we've got to get this bit right. Um, but the nice thing about this method is bec because of the fact that the strings are on, um, you can you know when to stop. You do it until it plays and then you don't do it anymore. And there's no other method you can say that about. Um, which sounds kind of a bit weird, but it's true. So, so, so if you're listening for efficacy, right? What we'll do is we'll, we'll level this track now, the A track. And what I'm going to invite you to do is listen to the notes played in a minute on the A string. Um, and I'm going to concentrate my pressure a little bit at this top end here because. So I know where the problems are really, so I want to take a bit more material away here. Okay, so we heard it zinging a little bit or buzzing when we were playing these A notes, okay? So now, again, how much I did there was, was experience based, you, you know, you can't get that without having the experience, but Tiny bit more, um, that's pretty close. So that you get to actually hear the improvement, which is why this method scores highly above all the others, as far as I'm concerned. So you can see I'm I'm working this tool in the what I call the A track, side to side, so it preserves the curve. I'm not trying to make a groove or anything like that. I'm just trying to level out these frets that are currently getting in the way of clean notes playing. And trying to get rid of as much of the dust as possible before we can wipe it down with naphtha cleaning stuff in a minute, but I want to get it as clean as possible before we do that because the danger is that that can turn into a bit of a soup. the whole lot and then we'll be done um, and then it'll be a case of removing the strings and the springs again and we'll get it all cleaned up and then we'll put new strings on um, and load it back up and we should go into the same after I've taken the, the action down a half of a turn okay that's good. Alrighty. So the, the low E track comes right to the edge. So I'm going to make sure this tool follows to the edge so there aren't a sort of high kicker right at the edge, which we don't need. And then I know there's one really, just one getting in the way right at the top here. So I'm going to i going to focus on making sure that's sorted out, which it should probably be, not too much trouble. And you, you normally be able to see it um, where the flat spots have to be if you've got, if you're taking out high bits. It's quite, it's, you get a lot of feedback from using this tool this way. Okay, so we should be. A 
Ta-da! Beautiful. Done. That's why I like that method. Right? I heard it with my own ears. I've not used any more, not had to use any more fret metal up in the process of uh, levelling that than is absolutely necessary. Ow! And then we can get on with um, re-crowning the frets now and polishing it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it forward, put in the block again and be ready for removing everything. Stay there, thank you. Okay. So next part of the thing is to um, get all the strings off. We'll tape a mask off the neck in a minute. Um, I'm going to throw these away now. We'll um, yeah, mask off the fingerboard and, and then we'll polish out the frets and then put it back together again. Um, as I say, hoped, hoped to have got away with it, but you could hear the, the buzzing happening and that was without it even being at its lowest target uh, target action that it should be able to do as an Ibanez. Should be no problem at all. So again, it's quite common. I've, it's not related to price point. I've had hugely expensive guitars that required fret leveling. I've had budget guitars that didn't require any. It's just completely down to luck in some ways. Or some factories better or worse quality control um, or precision on the day, you know, some some production runs just hit the uh, hit the mark perfectly. Um, not always the case, and and I say it's sort of brand independent. There are some brands that seem to get it really good a lot of the time. Things like PRS apparently is supposed to be quite good, um, but as I say, there's no guarantee. Okay, so there's all the strings out. Thank you for your service. Please go in the bin. I'm going to get a cloth, dry cloth, and just dust off those frets before we put any more stuff on them. Okay, so having to having had to do the fret leveling, that's um, keeping those strings saved. Saved us a set of strings, which obviously makes a lot of sense. We don't want to be throwing away five or a time on strings if we don't need them. Okay. Um, okay, this, I'm going to use the, obviously the low tack stuff to mask it off. I'm going to mask it off now before I do the uh, re-crowning so that we just keep as much of the goo off the fingerboard as possible. Ideally on a white coloured fingerboard like this probably would have been my preference to have Mask it off before, but I well the frets were off the first time. Uh, strings were off the first time, but I didn't. So we're going to do it this time. So we're out of the way. I can see where this is levelled. Um, it's had to. It's in certain places. It had to work quite hard to get rid of those buzzes. So it looks worse than it is every time. There'll be plenty of fret life in it, and like I said, with this method, um, more left than with any other method particularly something like a radius block which would be completely destructive I, I don't know I can't remember if this is a compound or straight radius but using the method I just used it doesn't really matter to that method it copes with it either way um, but you know, had it been uh, a compound radius a you couldn't level the frets with a radius block B um, if you're doing it with a, a beam it would compromise the radius quite a lot more than this method. So there's a, there's a whole kind of slew of reasons why this is a, a good way of doing it. Um, anyway, don't take my word for it, try it for yourself. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this over onto the dangler hanger for a minute um, while I uh, is anything loose no 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 uh, while I cut some more bits of paper to the right lengths hang up there please hang up 
there, please. What time is it? It is 20 past seven. Ah. Yes, like I said, if it had been my guitar, I would have possibly taken the first fret action down a nuance. I'd rather have the room to build up than be stuck higher than I want. Um, but it's not that far off on this guitar. And like I say, um, David didn't mention anything about the height being a problem or in any way that he doesn't like it. So I'm, on that basis, I'm not going to take, basically it would have to be destructive um, process, irrespective of which bit was being worn away. It would be a matter of wearing one or the other uh, away. And that's probably not a good choice. I mean it's doable for a later date or it's doable. Um, it's easy enough for uh, David to do if he wanted to just take it down a, you know, a tenth of a millimetre at a time. And, but I think uh, the, the only slight complication would be that it, it would need to come down more at the base end than the treble end. And that's, that's again quite easily doable when you're working on a sanding block. Um, but it's a branch of by hand and uh, hand and eye sort of affair. You've got to be confident on gauging uh, the way things are cutting. Now the first one of these I'm going to cut into four strips. I'm going to try to cut into four strips um, because it's a 24 fret guitar and it means that some of this, some of these frets are going to be very close together so we need some very thin strips to get anyway close to <laughs> Masking it off, and the normal one I go. The next ones I go into threes, two in threes, and then the final two in half, and that should be enough for the whole of this guitar. Not the best ruler for this job in the world. I wish I had something that could hold down easier. I'm also developing some sort of damaged nerve in my finger which is making this spark off in a very funny way when I put pressure on that hand. Okay halfway is down. Um, and now we nearly are. Okay and then we cut the down into little lengths. So tomorrow I've got, I'm dispatching uh, Adam's blue con construction a kit I built for him from his parts, his parts. Um, um, and uh, David will be coming over to collect this. So that's another reason to get it done tonight. Okay, so at this point we now go to the thickest of the bits of tape we've got here and we run down until we get thinner and thinner on the ground. And then when they don't quite meet, I'm going to do a a double just to secure it. Yeah, it was a funny, I was having a chat the other day with uh, actually with, with David about the way um, YouTube has gone uh, and it's effectively beginning to become or starting to be a, a sort of sensor of what it considers appropriate to be discussed and what it doesn't, um, which is a kind of an odd thing and I'm, I'm not pro any one group, party, body, individual or anything. I, my 
curse has always been that I can see something in just about every blasted perspective you care to name, which is, it does feel like a curse. But even, even where there are people whose views I dislike, oh, um, I really don't think I want any speech curtailed. Um, I think it's a very dangerous slope to be going down to ban words of any kind. You know, I've had this conversation before and somebody said, somebody said uh, on a Facebook, worst place to have a discussion, but somebody said on a discussion in which I made a comment, they said, oh, so it's okay to go around, you'd be happy then to, if you think, think all words are fine, then you'd be happy to go and use the N word or the something or other word. Uh, and it's a, a tricky one because no, I wouldn't because I know that we've already created a, a world in which a lot of people would take offence at that. Um, but I, I wish we hadn't made those words so powerful. And I wish that, um, <laughs> stuck to the magnet, um, I wish that, you know, it was, if people would divest those words of power. That maybe, you know, I've been accused of being idealistic and unrealistic as well. Um, which I don't really have an argument against. I, I guess you're right, those people who've said that. Um, but even if it can't be so immediately, I, I do, I would like, I would like to sort of work towards that, you know, so that where we don't, instead of teaching children in school that, you know, things have fixed meanings and therefore must be banned and, that, you know, words themselves have explosive incendiary power. Hello. Hello. How's it going? All right. You come to make sure I'm here and not out dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That would be the last thing I'd like <laughs> to do. Dinner's ready inside. Ah, thank you. I forgot about that aspect of life. Yeah, all right. I, did, I had to end up levelling the frets. So I didn't think I, you know, I thought that I'd get away with it on a nice Ibanez, but they needed doing. I was choking out on some notes, not even the bends, actually, some of the low notes. Um, well, make it play like it looks. Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully I've got the time to do it. Five. All right, have five. See you in five. Yeah. He said, losing track of time immediately. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, I, I, just, I just wish we... Which we, had, whilst recognising that words have currently have power to shock and hurt, I, I'd like to be acknowledging that, but kind of helping people not to be at the mercy of words. It'd be much better than, than banning every word. You know, that, that's the worry to me is that if, if you if you go from if you proceed from the basis. The, the understanding, if you like, the reality that words have power to hurt, um, then, it, you know, literally, the logical conclusion is there's no limit to the words you will ban if they're, you know, if, if said words are deemed to hold egregious offence to somebody. And, and, you know, where will we be in the end? You know, um, it would just be a, it should be a crazy world of nobody saying anything for fear of upsetting somebody and you know communication will who knows what it will become anyway so rather than that what i think is a quite an ex extraordinary extreme and unworkable extreme i i've always been you know let's, let's focus on if you like helping kids yeah our kids if we have them um people we know if we don't have kids or whatever but just helping people to take back this you know so take back, take back the power not to be offended and I know I know a lot of people are very attached to it and I suppose I probably would and somebody in the comments on Facebook said ah well you know you you'd be you, you'd be furious if somebody called your mother or something or other and actually I, I have to say I wouldn't because I don't give it the power there's no insult you can do because 
I've chosen in advance not to be insulted. Um, and, so, and some people think that's a, a glib, an unrealistic thing. And, and actually, they can't say that's true for me because it is true for me. I'm, you know, I'm not insultable really. Um, but that's a choice, you know. Um, and I'd like to focus on you know, helping other people come to that freedom from offence because it is a sort of slavery to be so you know to, to have to react all the time just because somebody decides to be undignified and you know intend to be rude with their speech which, which somebody's always going to do if they're ignorant and unenlightened there's no real protection from that um, you know other than this absurdity of banning all speech anything that could be offensive um, it, it has a, an absurd logical out, you know, conclusion, and we all know it. It's absurd to take take it to its conclusion, and, and people try to be reasonable and stop somewhere along the line, and they go, they go, well, you know, of, of course it would be ludicrous taken to its extreme, but we're not suggesting that. We're just saying certain things can't be said, but it's like you can't stop there. It, you know, if the, if the number of things that can't be said is governed only by the whoever it is that complains about them, then you have an unlimited potentially an unlimited number of things that one day just can't be said. And that's just, that's ridiculous. I mean, it just is not only ridiculous, but it's utterly unworkable. And it's that I object to. You know, and then of course you get some people who go, oh, you just want to insult people. You know, you're just fighting for your right to be bigoted and unkind to somebody or some particular group that you don't like. And it's like, of course it's not that. The principle of it bothers me. And actually, you know, I, I'm totally bothered also by those people who choose to do anything to upset somebody else. I hate the quality of some people whose intention is to hurt other people, whether they use words or, or cruelty of some other kind, or stones or sticks or bullets. I hate it. So wanting, wanting not to be, not to have speech shut down for fear of offence does not automatically equate to wanting to hurt people. It's just ridiculous. That's a, that's a lazy, very scared attempt at shutting down uh, a position. And it's, it's ridiculous. But it's what people will say. Oh, you just want to reserve the right to be intolerant of somebody or other. No. I want to reserve your right to say anything you like about me. I think the only thing the only thing that's probably fair to contest is when falsehoods are stated, I think the the business of um, the business of libel slander is probably has some ground because that's that's because um, truths fact, uh, you know, empirical truths being misused and lies being told to damage somebody is a, a testable, provable, demonstrable thing and it shouldn't go on. But anyway, I'm going to go in and get some to eat and uh, I'll see you in a bit. Just quickly, I'm going to, um, I've done, done the, um, that thing, reprofiling. I'm now going to do the polishing out with papers and micro mesh set. And then I'm going to come back at the end of all of that to refitting the bridge. I've changed the action here a tiny bit more. And that's all I'm going to do for it. The only adjustment I'm going to make anymore. And then we'll put it back together again with new strings. But I'm going to go off camera because this is quite boring and long-winded sanding it out. Um, while I'm sanding, I'll also aim to just round off these edges here with the sandpaper as I go. Okay, so I'm going to listen to the radio while I do it with my different grades of paper, and I'll see you in a minute. Ah, right. All the hard polishing done. A fair bit of um, dust around, but we'll sort that out in a second. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And taking off all the masking tape. You'll see just how much it's protected it. OK. 
come along now. Yes, anyway. <clears throat> agency ownership I would much rather <coughs> support people into not being at the mercy of somebody else's statements or words than to be part of a campaign of banning words even at a goodwill you know of protecting people's feelings and so on. It just can't work. It can't work. Right. So, anyway, so YouTube is, <laughs> is yeah, YouTube is changing what's allowed to be, or it's, it's, it's got some restrictions on what you can and can't say. And if it decides that you're subject is too controversial or I don't know might be disturbing because it's too near reality or the bone or I don't know <clears throat> whatever the algorithm decides then you can't say it which I think is really disturbing so um, which is why that's kind of reason I got onto that in the first place it's just the, the idea that um, You know, the biggest thing going on in the world at the moment is, of course, this question of flu and the idea that we can't discuss it without falling foul of risking the wrath of Google because it thinks it's, YouTube thinks it's too, <coughs> too, I don't know, um, sensitive or serious a subject that's mad must be able to discuss things. Oh, we will. It's just that Google will try and demonetize people's things if they talk about things like that. Anyway, right, I'm just cleaning off the dust. Nice, nice, nice. <coughs> throw away, throw away. Right, so I've done the adjustment. Done the adjustment, done the adjustment, so now it's time to reconnect this thing. I forgot which side it went now. Mm -hmm. Like that. So we're going to do that thing again with that. Uh, with this, with the, that one. Can't get the angle just right. That's really annoying. <laughs> See? forward to keep it from springing back out. That's the hard bit. Well, it's not so hard, but you can only do it if you've got your hands underneath there right now, like I have. One. Anyway, whether Google likes it or not, uh, it's quite something to be faced with and kill a flu virus or kill a virus. Hmm. 
Hmm. It's bound to be turning up in this country soon. I mean, it's already here now, no doubt about it. But any minute now, I'll get the first fatalities reports, no doubt. Okay, so there's my basic setup. Here's my little bits that have fallen out again. Tuck them back in. So, next key bit. So, what have we done? We've done, <coughs> we've obviously polished the frets and cleaned them all up. We're now going to restring, and the key part about this is, if my fingers recover from holding that tremolo, the key part about this now is to um, <clears throat> is to um, stretch these out before we lock them down, so that David doesn't have to spend spends as little time as possible uh, adjusting them. But also, so we've got a range of adjustment here. Um, Okay, so there's the bottom. <coughs> there's the top. <coughs> Just trying to, my, that's already all the way down. Wow. Okay, that's blocked off by there. That's not, no, let's wait till we've got the <coughs> strings on. Um, yeah, so we, we have to make sure <coughs> that these adjusters are all in their right ideal places. Um, in order to get them uh, give them enough room to adjust once the strings are stretched and tightened out. It looks like it's got quite a lot of adjustment room on this particular brand so that'll be interesting. Um, so I'm cutting off the ball and yeah, doing a little bit of a bend <coughs> down, I'm guessing it a bit, but I'm sure it's about right. It's enough to hold it anyway. Yep. Yeah, so once I've got the blocks out of the way, <coughs> I'll be able to do it, check and adjust all of those micro tuners. And like I say, we. Some guitars do it differently. Some need an equal amount of room to adjust in both directions, and some only ever go downwards, tightening. Um, but it's never, it's never a completely foregone conclusion. So we can't really assume that it's one way or the other. We have to leave it some potential for both directions. And this is just fiddly, to say the least, because it's pointing in the wrong direction. You need a shorter arm hex key than this. Let's see how this one fits in here. Yeah, so critical is getting it, getting it all stretched out before you lock it down and making sure that you have all the adjustment room in your micro tuners ready to go back available to you so sometimes you, when you change strings you may have run out of adjustment from the previous time in which case you want to get that all set up <coughs> ready for the next go usually means winding them back out So the, I mean, the secret of the Floyd Rose, this type of, or the edge, this edge bridge, um, it's like all others really, it's about equilibrium, you know, getting the, the strings and the springs and the strings to reach equilibrium. I can't get this to grip, <coughs> I don't know why. That's better. 
yeah, getting them to equilibrium. Once you've got them to e equilibrium and you've <coughs> stretched them out, then they are ready. And the adjuster is very simple on these at the back. If you if you find the plate isn't parallel to the body, then the adjuster <coughs> allows you to make up the difference. Just like okay, so don't really need that much threaded through here. Um, I'm going to give it a little tiny pull back. Uh, but it doesn't really. I'm going to do a fret's worth to be to use my normal sort of approach, but actually hardly needs any. The locking tuners are going to do most of the work on this. <coughs> um, but I'll, I'll stick to the normal small amount of wind on. So pull, I pull back about uh, just about a fret's width um, or a fret's distance and then wrap it round and we go over the held string the first time and under sorry over the the held string goes over the loose string the first time round and then under it the second time round which makes a little locking effect which is quite tidy <coughs> Sunday night. Tomorrow, dispatch Adams, give this one back to David, and then get on to finishing some more because I've got a couple more coming in during the week. Um, so I get some of my own stuff done in the gap. Sometime this week, I should go and do some routing. method. Can't stand it. Don't like. Can hear owls outside now. Howling away. Okay, so tidying up metal shards. <coughs> See, the Yamaha SE series held the spare ball part, <coughs> or held the ball part, the string, down inside the bridge, taking all the load so you didn't have to have those little squeezy gripper things, which feel like very crazy, like blunt force to try and hold strings in place. Just doesn't feel right to me. Um, so that's why I like the Yamaha some of the bridges. Okay. Don't mess me around.
Right, so I'm going to take this off and it's going to drop back <coughs> and tighten up madly. Fine. Okay, so now is the time to get some stretching done. So I'm going to give it all some gentle bedding in to begin with. <coughs> And then we're not even going to really bother about the tuning just yet. We just want to get everything bedded in and stretched. Obviously the tram is going to flap about all over the place. <clears throat> and when I've done a few of these, then it will be time to start aiming for a tuning, or finding a note and heading for it. <clears throat> now with this, um, to take these out. Let's go out to their furthest out point. Okay, so let's go in one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Give it some room in both directions, mostly tightening, but a little bit back <coughs> in case. You never know. Of course the locking nuts are going to go a long way towards stabilising the tuning. <clears throat> but if you don't do this first, you'll still catch the thing shedding loads of slack after you put the uh, tighten up the locking nuts and you'll still find you might run out of micro adjustment straight away. Now I'm going to do this with a tuner, but I'm going to go for the note first. to give me a start point and then I'm going to go here stretch think about um, assuming that your trim is going to go back to the same place with the same gauge strings um, <coughs> If it does, you, it's good and you're lucky. Um, otherwise, you have to start from the beginning to get it back into position. But And then after this, I'm going to lock down the locking nuts and see where we go. So you see there's still that detuning happening on the E. <clears throat> it's quite common. Well, maybe one more time like this. Okay, 
We'll lock it down next. The reason I left some uh, give in the downward movement on the, what do you call it, uh, those things, the micro tuners, is that sometimes different guitars have a different amount of, uh, I don't know what the word is, when you tighten these down they can uh, press right the way down and cause the notes to go sharp. <clears throat> I think on the Ibanez like this, yeah, see it's gone sharp. That's okay, so you need that little bit of adjustment room. Hopefully we have left enough, we'll see. If not, <clears throat> we'll undo it and have another little go. This time by setting it slightly flat before we tighten them down. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> now, having just done that, I'm actually going to all out, all out, all out, all out, all out, all out. Sounds like glider pilot. One, two, three, four. 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 Right, <clears throat> gonna undo this again. Just re-tighten, re-tune to fractionally flat and give myself a bit more room this time. That won't help, will it? <clears throat> Let's take this off for a second because it's distorting. Well. Flat, slightly flat, right? <clears throat> Tighten them up, go. Tighten them up, go. Right, I've got plenty of upward tuning space, but we need downward, see?
go. A bit of leeway either side should be. What's it clunking on? <clears throat> Pray tell. Nice and flat. Let's have a look here. No, it's not before. That's exactly where it was, how it was, same position, exactly the same position on the mark, on the mark. And then that's the idea is that pushing that back stops that going down to there. Weird, is that part of how this was before? Weird, weird, weird. You know what's happened? That's the that's the tremolo arm, if you ask me. <clears throat> Here's the arm. Wow, how weird is that? Okay, well, we're down, we're down, where are we down to now? Yes, 1.5 on the mark, <clears throat> 1.2, spot on. A little bit of guesswork at, at the end in terms of that final action, but that's absolutely brilliant. I am pleased with that. I'm going to put the back cover on now. <clears throat> and we're done for this Sunday night. And I'm just going to, oh, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ah. we had one little job. Glad I turned it over. We had one little job to do here. This little fella <coughs> is scuffed. And it's catch it's unpleasant and it catches on David's clothes. <coughs> I will either sand it back or we'll compare it. Stainless steel black neck screws. We'll compare it and see if we've got something in here that is the same beastie? Well, they're not. That's chunkier. That's not either. Okay. I'm, I'm always reluctant to replace it with uh, another thing, so we will throw some screws. We'll quick look in here see if there's any floating about. Doubt it. Black screws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe. I'll have a look. That's a possible, but only if it's exactly. <clears throat> yeah, it's a little bit thinner. I mean, in a way, it, it would be scuff free, but I think I would rather use the original, which means. I'll just away for a minute.
And the thing is, it's taken the black off, but <clears throat> the idea is to stop it scratching on clothing. And there's only one way to do that, <clears throat> and that's to get rid of the burr. Have a look how much you put a bit of black on it which will cover it up for now but it's not perfect it'll come uncovered again but at least it won't scratch your clothes anymore a squeeze. Fabulous, fabulous, done for today. Sorry about the boring angles. Ah, oh, I didn't take any close-ups. Oh. oh well, I wasn't thinking, sorry. G370 modern version. Okay, I'm done for now. I'm going to put this back in the box and we'll be finished. See you soon.